it's very nice to have you. It's our community you know, and I'm Mary Davidson, and I love introducing you to our neighbors. This, this gentleman happens to really be my neighbor, and um, I am very proud of that. His name is Roderick Townley. He is an author, and um, the latest book uh, is called A Bitter Magic. And, you know, I, I have to say, it would not, I wouldn't normally choose a book that's written for teenage mm -hmm. children. But I honestly enjoyed reading this book. And it's, uh, it's interesting, and I love the cover because it's, uh, I, I think that, talk about the cover a little bit since we're discussing this. Because well, uh, I think the cover gives us a thought about mm -hmm. what we might expect from the book. You might notice that the heroine, Sylvia, uh, Cicely Thumog is her name, uh -huh. is holding a lobster on the cover. Yes. And, Elwin. And, and we're going to talk about Elwin. Oh, yeah. Good. Yes. Good. Oh, yes. And that the castle behind her yes. is a glass castle. It's a glass castle and it appears to be almost floating. So it's a floating glass castle, et cetera. And so yes. it sounds like this is a very airy fairy story, but it's really very down to earth at the same time. Well, so we we want to kind of titillate our readers with um, with the cover so that they can um, um, be enticed into buying the book. How could they not be? Well, that's right. That's <laughs> right. Uh, the color of the cover is basically blue. Was that um, a conscious choice? Well, it wasn't my choice because um, I, I didn't. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to show these folks the cover if you don't mind. Oh, so I didn't obviously do the cover, yeah. or, or else I'd be a famous there it is. painter. Um, so it what, was. What would the color choice have been? What would you have chosen? Uh, well, I don't know because I, I think I I love this. I, love a, this. I think blue. I think is more mysterious. Yeah, and I, I love the blowing hair, and I love the fact that it's a hint of a lobster, and the lobster is on a golden leash, uh, which is, well, you just has make a, out. He has a golden collar, yes he does. Yes. And we're going to talk about Elwin, okay. so, so we will Tell release some of the, uh, the pieces of Elwin's personality uh, to the readers. What you said to me, you left me a little sticky note in the front, and you said to me, this is a fantasy, but a fantasy in the service of reality. Hmm. Would you explain yourself, well, Mr. It, Townley? In a way, it's, well, I, this is my eighth book for young readers. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it's the most extravagant uh, in terms of fantastical elements. I think so. The, I've read the, all of them, so yes, I think so. Yeah, there's um, a mirror that doesn't reflect. There, um, uh, There's a closet of whispering ball gowns. And a glass a, thumb that uh, does okay, burns holes yes. and things. <laughs> Someone has a, or ends up with a glass thumb um, uh -huh. and uh, all, all kinds of things that you would think would be just fun things for kids to dream about. But also, the, I found myself in deeper themes. First of all, my 12-year-old, then 13-year-old heroine, Cicely Thummel, mm -hmm. is really all by herself. Uh, uh, she is a very uh, isolated kid. Mm -hmm. uh, her mother, uh, uh, disappeared uh, during a magic act. So it's basic. Well, they are a family premise. of magicians. Yes. A brother and a sister. The brother and the sister. Yeah. The sister being Cicely's mother. Mm -hmm. she, and um, she disappears. And so basically uh, Cicely is uh, orphaned uh, and is looking for her mother and hoping that she's not dead. Uh, so that's well, That's a very serious Don't thing. you think that when that happens, particularly to young people, it throws them into a, um, a, a fantasy kind of world so that they can block out some of the, the tragedy in their lives? 
by by reading about this. Yeah, you know? and 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 by imagining themselves as well. Yes. Well, I guess most kids uh, at some point think of themselves as uh, orphans, alone in the world. They've got to figure out every, how to live, and it's a big world, and they're very small. <laughs> That's true. Uh, That's true. So. But but I think that um, the magic of um, uh, Marina, who is Sicily's mother, is interesting. And I'm wondering if I could get you to read a portion of the book uh, on page eight. Okay. And um, start where sure. she's sure. Um, well, here um, the, the, adjic the magic act is well underway, mm -hmm. and uh, Cicely's mother is the most said to be the most beautiful woman in Europe. And she's the assistant, supposedly. The music swells. Mother appears in a pool of light. In flowing silks and with a white silk scarf around her shoulders, she stands perfectly still at the front of the stage, which is in built out into the audience. Behind her, behind her is a panel of black glass. The crowd hushes. The scarf begins to ripple, although there is no breeze. Then little floating lights appear, swarms of them. She lifts her chin and stares into the distance. I lean forward. Slowly, the tiny lights orbit Mother. Soon, I notice there are fewer lights than before and less of my mother. Parts of her dress, her arms, her hair are just not there. More lights disappear. More of my mother disappears. She's dissolving in front of my eyes. The audience begins to realize what's happening. Ladies peer through opera glasses. The Archduke in his box across the way gets abruptly to his feet. The last points of light blink out. The place where Mother stood is bare. That's not quite true. Her white scarf flutters down and drapes itself on the edge of the stage. And Mother is gone on page eight. Right. <laughs> So, and so the rest of the book is trying to find her. It's trying to find Mother. But in looking for Mother, there are some really interesting um, characters that appear. And one of them that I really liked, and you made mention of, of the uh, lobster, is Elwin. And Elwin talks as he says, mind to mind, mm -hmm. which I thought was interesting. Talk about Elwin. I want to know, why did you pick a lobster? <laughs> why, uh, you know, I want to, it's interesting to know, I think, what the authors are thinking when they put uh, the story down on paper. Well, that was just a flash of inspiration. <laughs> uh, it's a flash of inspiration that my editor said, why don't you take out the lobster? It's too confusing. Um, and I said, no. <laughs> no, La Elwin must be there. Um, actually, Elwin is, I named him for, for uh, the uh, children's author E.B. White. Uh -huh. His first name is Elwin. Oh. E.B. White. Uh -huh. Elwin Brooks White. And so uh, there's a little of uh, E.B. White, uh, who, of course, uh, Charlotte's Web and all those yeah. wonderful things. Yeah. I like to pay homage in subtle ways to. Well, I think that's nice. But I will say that uh, it may appear that Elwin is not uh, part of the story, but as the, toward the ending, it becomes clear that Elwin is part of the story, uh, along mm -hmm. with a uh, cock shell who um, talks uh, about, uh, calls himself a breath inside the wind. Mm -hmm. And the cock shell talks as the well. The cock shell, right. Uh, or to, appears to Sicily. To, or appears to Sicily. To, yeah, mm -hmm. no, one, no one can hear these creatures, except the 12-year-old girl. Um, and is she really hearing it, or is she imagining it, or is something else happening altogether? Uh, and you don't know until the end. Right. So, and we have to be very careful, uh, Roderick, that we do not give away this, right. this plot. My That's lips right. are sealed. Our lips are sealed. But be, be it, uh, um, let our audience feel comfortable in knowing that the talking conch shell and the lobster with the golden uh, leash, leash uh, who talk um, are very um, 
much a part of the mm -hmm. of the plot as as it goes mm -hmm. on. But as I say, the, the the plot became deeper and deeper to me. Uh -huh. the, first of all, there's the the question difference between tricks, illusions, and real magic. Uh, that's a, that's one of the great things, uh, dichotomies of going through the book, which is which. And just toward the end uh, of the book, it begins to question whether there's also a difference <coughs> between magic and miracles. Uh, and so it becomes a, a rather a deeper thing than I thought I was dealing with when I first started the book. Well, don't you think much of life is a dichotomy? Yes, or in this case, a trichotomy. A trichotomy, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> that's right. You know, um, I read a lot, as I'm sure you do as I well. Know. And I find that if the first uh, page in the first chapter doesn't hold my interest, it's really hard for me to slog through that book. And the, <laughs> uh, the first sentence here, uh, this is chapter one. It says, her eyes had, now remember, this is written for teenage uh, girls, I would think, mostly. Anybody. Yeah. Her eyes had that special glint they get when she's about to do something she shouldn't. I've learned to be careful with mother, not argue, just be careful. Which I, now. It, it gets you nervous right away. That's right? right. Now, that first sentence is really important. How do you decide what that, is that, something that you have to, to tussle with? the first sentence uh, takes longer than the first four chapters because, well, I, it could be said, it goes back to my years as a writer for TV Guide magazine um, mm -hmm. back in the 80s um, because I knew that if the casual reader uh, isn't caught in the first sentence, the very first sentence, He'll just toss the book, or you know, or he'll just not read the article. That's right. I It'll end up at the bottom of a bird cage. That's right. Uh, so um, I learned to be get in fast and catch the reader immediately, and never let go. Uh, you got you never release your grip entirely. <laughs> That's right. The the old jugular you have well in hand. <laughs> well, I, at least the sleep. That's right, that's right. So you do spend uh, some time thinking about that first sentence or two. Uh, very, very many times. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever, um, I, I just, I like to talk to writers. Do you ever get writer's block and you just can't think of another doggone thing to say about this for a while? <sighs> do yes. You? Well, I had one for several years Did uh, in my younger, <laughs> younger days. <laughs> and, so you uh, thought it was all gone. I actually uh, had... Uh, it came out of uh, a childhood trauma, really, and, and so I eventually I had to see a psychologist and uh -huh. understand that what I was, what was blocking me, was really an illusion, and it was okay to write. I wasn't doing anything um, wrong. Yeah. So it, it, I eventually allowed myself to write, but still, still, um, my wife will tell you, uh, I'm not easy to live with in the first third of a book. Uh oh. Uh-oh. Maybe not after that either, but uh, <laughs> certainly it's the beginning. Well, and there's another, another thing that always interests me. You have um, uh, a, a mini love interest in the book, and, and his name is Cole. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a sort of a peculiar name for a person. Ha naming people is also mm -hmm. of interest, yes? Huge. Uh -huh. Hugely important. I, I mean... I w danced around when I found Elwyn the, for the name of the lobster, mm -hmm. but uh, also I started the, I started with the name of, of my little heroine, before I knew what the book was going to be, um, because Cicely Thummel, wonderful name, isn't it? It is. Uh, is a real person. Oh. Uh -huh. uh, she's a journalist who lives uh -huh. in Leewood, uh -huh. and she interviewed me and my wife uh, for years ago for uh -huh. some other article, uh, some article she was writing uh, for a magazine about us. And uh, you thought I that said, is a name I need to remember. Cicely, would you give me permission to use your name? Uh -huh. And she said, my name? I, I, I'm not very interesting. And I said, I don't know whether that's true or not, but I don't care if you're interesting or not. <laughs> I like your name. <laughs> and, and she said, okay, but I hadn't even begun to write the book yet. But yes, it was, 
I knew I could use that name. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how. And coal? I mean, he isn't very mm -hmm. clean, but I don't know. No, it's C-O-L-E. Yeah, it's, uh -huh. it's a name. Uh, you don't want to make it Mike somehow or, yeah. or Joe. Uh, although those are perfectly excellent names. It's just that... It, they don't grab you as fantasy. They, they didn't lead me forward. Well, they don't, they don't fit into a book of fantasy. Yeah, and, yeah. and also uh, it has to be a name that I can do something with internally. Yeah. That, that well, the names are wonderful. Oh, and the poor lock is her aunt. Porlock. Yes, and and I and I, you know, and Miss um, Porlock. Yeah. Miss Porlock. Yes, and the butler's name begins with an S. I yes, yes. butler's name also came from E. B. White. Uh, butler is a short fellow. Uh -huh. His name is Strunk. Strunk. That's right. As short as his name, but maybe you remember that uh, E. B. White collaborated with um, Professor Strunk to write um, Elements of Style. Uh, this this Bible of how to write and mm -hmm. how not to write and to, how to avoid adjective itis and all kinds of things. So, Strunk and White is on almost every bookshelf in college. I had th I didn't really focus in on that, but now that you mentioned yeah. it, I do remember. Yeah. So yeah, I yeah. thought Strunk. Okay, I've got Elwin. Why not use Strunk? Why not? You know. Um, Holding the plot together mm. is difficult. And you have once read that, you know, we remember things as we read a book. And one of the threads that, to me, I remember is Cicely's ability to smell things. Yeah. And the scent of roses leads her many places that she would hit her head on uh, the end of a maze if she didn't smell that scent of roses. Mm -hmm. And of course, th the original title I had for the book was not A Bitter Magic, but The Black Rose. Mm -hmm. And A Black Rose, as we know, is interesting because it cannot exist. There's no such thing as a black rose because black is not a color. In fact, it's the absence of color. I think of it as sort of a black hole in, in space mm -hmm. which would suck all things into it. Mm -hmm. So if it was, a, I don't mean a black rose like black like your shoes. I mean, pure black mm -hmm. would be uh, an impossibility. It'd probably be invisible. And so the uncle is trying to create a black rose, hoping to get real magic powers from Which that. he, but he does not have, but his sister Marina and Cicely's mother does have. Right. And, uh, but you, you're, you're not, um, exclusive because you use a white rose as well. Right, and it almost becomes symbolic. Yes. In black magic, white magic. Yes, see, and, and there, that is a, a, a point that we really should pull out because there are symbolic things all through the book. Oh yeah. And um, it does make you uh, think a bit. In holding the plot together, <laughs> <laughs> how do you keep your thinking straight so that you don't drop anything out. H how do you map out the book? I should map it out more fully at the beginning, but I don't seem to be able to. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I don't really know how it's going to resolve itself. So, I, it's like uh, someone said, if you drive a car at night and you can see only as far as your headlights, um, if you follow your headlights, you'll eventually find your way home, uh, <laughs> even if you don't know the whole route. Uh, so I sort of write that way. I, I try to know a little ahead of where I am. In fact, as far ahead of, as I can imagine. But that changes. And then if I come two-thirds of the way through and I realize, hmm, I, I can go back and, and readjust what came before, too, because it is, after all, um, something you do in private and no one sees you uh, making a mistake. So you have time to correct it. So I correct my plots as I go along. Well, and that's, uh, that's okay, because it's, but it is easy to drop things off oh, and you no. think, what happened? I remember one time <laughs> I, I, in, I interviewed yeah. a very nice man that wrote a rather interesting mystery. This has been a number of years ago. And there was a character that appeared and all of a sudden, whoop, 
<laughs> Not there. No, you've got to yeah. keep all the strings of your puppet um, or the marionette. Although I don't know who's holding the marionette strings. <laughs> you haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> I'm not sure it's me. <laughs> <laughs> well, when do you think? Do you think as you write, or did you think it up pretty much before you started to write? Well, that's when you get into the writing block. Uh, thing. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Uh, yes, it's as before and after. Uh, so it's at all it's a, points. It's a constant. Uh, uh, project in in work in yeah. progress. I think uh, a good writer is one a who reads a lot, but who also loves to revise, mm -hmm. because people who just I said it that's the way it is. Um, Take it or leave it. That's right. Yeah. And usually people will leave it uh -huh. because yeah. you have to, as I say, uh, as you said, um, pull it all together, and all those strings need to arrive somewhere, that, as, as I hope they do at the final page of this book. Uh, oh, they do. They do. Oh, thank you. Oh, they do. Thank you. Um, the attributes that you assign to different people are interesting as well. Uh -huh. And Sicily um, has the magic of healing, yes. uh, uh, which is uh, extremely interesting and comes in very handy. She also can bend things like the key that she could bend to get mm -hmm. into the lock that kept her out of her mother's room to which she was not allowed. But when she got in, uh, afforded her uh, some answers to some of the questions. Right, right, right. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, the magic of healing, to mm -hmm. me, was sort of a foreshadow. Mm -hmm. Did you see that at all? Or did maybe, maybe I'm imagining things, I don't know. No, go ahead. I, I, I don't know. People will bring what they well, what to me, they wish. You, you tell, the author tells me things mm -hmm. that they want me to remember right. because I'm a mystery story reader. Good. So a, in order to be a good mystery story reader, you have to pick up the threads yeah. as they go along. And, when, and, and this happened pretty close to the beginning of the book that Cecily was, we knew that she was a healer, but we first found out that she could bend things. So I thought, you know what? He's going to bring that up later. That's a foreshadow. <laughs> well, that's true. And, that's true. and so I, I thought, now I, I need to, to remember that. The other thing that I thought was so interesting, um, her mother in, uh, gave her a gift. Mm -hmm. And the gift was um, a bottle, to describe that, <laughs> to a bottle that was on her mother's dresser that her mother calls elementals were in them, the little points of light. Mm -hmm. Several tiny lights slipped in. And her mother then recorked the bottle and she gave it to her daughter in case you need a night light, she said. Mm -hmm. A present, she said. My mother giving me a present, I couldn't stop staring at it the tiny light circling and weaving. In uh, Eastern religions, there is the concept of elementals, which are difficult to, to define, but I describe them as little points of light, but there might be points of memory, points of magic, that um, Marina, beautiful Marina, is able, because she does have this magic, to marshal and to invoke and to have swirl around her, and and that's how she disappears too. The, when there are fewer and fewer uh, elementals, there's less and less of the mother, and uh, the elementals are apparently able to be coached and told what to do, like to to mend a, a ruined dress, for instance, uh, to um, uh, to do all kinds of things. Um, it's hard to explain. I'll just let the reader wonder about it because uh, I can't. Because there's I don't a lot. Know the answer to well, it. there's a lot to wonder about. Yeah. And and the good part is that there is no right or wrong answer. No, no, really. Um, so, especially uh, when the author is not sure of what's entirely going on. <laughs> uh, well, it's interesting when Cecily gets into her mother's room and sees her mother's picture. She said, "I stare at her face, at her eyes." at the black rose she holds so tightly in her hand. And already, 
in the room, she had seen a white rose in a vase. Mm -hmm. So she says, a black rose, a white rose, mother, who are you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which I thought was really kind of nice. Finding out who her mother really is is the final revelation to, to Sicily. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. Don't you think that being lonely is a problem of many people and oh. it helps them to be able to relate to the character of the little girl. Yeah, well, C Cicely is alone. She also becomes much stronger and stronger as the book goes on. Because at first she doesn't think that she has it. She's a regular person. She just doesn't know that and it, people actually put bandages on a cut. She always heals them by just holding it. And the uh, heat, she feels the yeah, heat. Yeah, the heat builds, mm -hmm. and then she takes the hand away, and there's no sign of it. But she thought everybody does that. She, she's so isolated um, that, uh, it, yes, I think all kids feel, all adults, everybody, has feelings of being very much alone uh, at times. Oh, Sometimes we're, so. we're, we're too much with others, but even when we're with others, there's that part of us that is the observer and that is sometimes very lonely. Well, I have to say that you inserted a poem in here that I thought was kind of interesting, a Scottish oh. poem. Oh. And you said, What though on Hamley Fair we dine, we're hot and gray and a that. Ye fools their silks and knaves their wine, a man is a man for a that. For a that, yeah. yeah. Well, Robert Burns. Robert Burns. And I thought that was, and you know, a, a young person that reads that might take the time to find something. Yeah. So you have tooked in to this book some some challenges, I think. Oh, well, yes. I, I think I, so. I, I frankly don't think of myself as writing for children. Um, I write for, well, whatever the story requires. Uh, mm -hmm. And I write for myself and for my wife, Wyatt. And Who, by the way, was the... It, Poet Laureate of Kansas yes, last until, year, I, mu uh, I must tell you Until that. very recently. Yes. So she's now passed the, um, <laughs> the scepter yes. or the sunflower yes. to the next uh, Poet Laureate. Yes. And uh, she's a wonderful, wonderful poet and a great editor of me and uh, my muse, actually. And that's, that's really what it's all about, isn't yeah. it? And you, you know, it, it makes one think, what is real? Hmm. Exactly. Yes, that, this book brings up that whole question. What's real and what's illusion? And uh, isn't, isn't this really an illusion? Uh, isn't uh, everything uh, just a swirl of atoms and uh, subatomic particles? In, in, or in elementals. Or elementals. Elementals. Elemental, yes. yes. And as I thank Roderick Townley for writing a bitter magic and for coming to talk with us today. Uh -huh. I leave you with this question. Not only what is real, but can we make realistic fantasies real with hard work, concentration, and a little a little bit of luck. Yeah. So read the book and um, I know you'll enjoy it. Thank Roderick, you. thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's oh, delightful. It's always, always a pleasure. Great. And thank you for coming to visit. We'll see you soon again because it is our community.